Hi again, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depend where you are on the globe. We are waiting just uh, one or two minutes to get started. Is uh, Professor Wolfgang Preiser on the call? Samuel, I I receiving messages uh, some that uh, it was thought to be a three uh, South African time. I'm not sure where the confusion are coming from. Winifred, can you check for us? Sorry, I'm asking Winifred to check the time for uh SAS, CSM, Mr. South Africa. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Wolfgang. We, you are muted. Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon, colleagues. Okay. So uh, in interest of time, uh, we're going to get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this uh, first series of uh, Afri Health webinar. Again, we apologize for the few minute delay. Uh, it seems like there's been some confusion on the uh on the timing uh but uh at least uh, we have the first speaker on uh i'm gonna let uh, uh prof wolfgang uh, prizer to introduce himself and kick off for this session uh wolfgang it's up to you thank you very much uh, jean good afternoon colleagues um um wherever you may be it's a, it's a great pleasure uh being uh, able to 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 give this uh, brief presentation uh, my apologies so, somehow my my calendar thought it it would be at uh, three o'clock south african time but thank you for the warning john here i am and um in in terms of background um i am the head of the division of medical virology at the university of stellenbosch uh, in tigerberg um, and our division also comprises a busy diagnostic laboratory, which is part of the South African National Health Laboratory Service. Um, I have a long-standing interest in emerging infectious diseases, um, both in their uh, zoonotic sources, but also then their spread in the human population, oftentimes uh, with a diagnostic uh, um, from a diagnostic angle, um, because that is what I do for a living. So we need to ensure that uh, potential cases are diagnosed. That said, in the past um, couple of years, and I'll come to that in more detail in a moment, um, several cases of suspected mpox infection have passed our lab, but we have not done a single test. The reason being that so far South Africa has had only a few cases, so uh, diagnostic testing is still centralized at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. There has not yet been uh, a need to roll out testing to the other public health laboratories. So I, I do not have first-hand experience on, on diagnosing uh, MPOC so far. What I would like to do is just set the scene. Um, the next speaker will go into the situation in, in, in Eastern DRC and neighboring countries, but I would like to, to cast the net a, a bit wider uh, and start actually uh, with a bit of history. Now we are staying on the continent, but going many thousands of years back. And this is the 
uh, the mummified head of an Egyptian pharaoh and um, with a bit of, of uh, um, you know, preparedness, you will see that uh, there seem to be skin lesions that have been described as reflecting uh, smallpox. So uh, it seems that even at the time, uh, the pharaoh had suffered from and hopefully survived um, a smallpox um, infection. In subsequent uh, millennia, smallpox uh, was one of the major infectious disease killers of humankind. Uh, it played major roles in history. For example, when the Spanish um, came to, to what is now Latin America, uh, Mexico, their conquests were uh, greatly aided uh, by them, inadvertently, of course, bringing along um, smallpox, um, to which the uh, original populations of the, of the New World, of the Americas, had not previously been exposed. So everybody was in this virgin uh, uh, epidemic was susceptible and it wreaked havoc on the on the uh, uh, local uh, nations and helped the Spanish to uh, to conquer. Uh, this is a more recent uh, photograph of a smallpox case from the 1970s, uh, when that terrible disease uh, still existed. Um, and of course, uh, you, you will be aware that uh, over. 200 uh, years ago, uh, this was the first uh, vaccine ever introduced against the human infectious disease uh, before uh, the concept of a virus and of infection had been properly worked out. Even then, uh, famous Edward Jenner, uh, who, who started vaccinating, um, preceding him, um, some other cultures um, from whom Lady Wortley Montague had learned that via variolation, that is the, um, um, the uh, um, use of, of dried up material from uh, smallpox cases um, that were then pulverized and uh, 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 scarified into the skin of others would with a bit of luck you know, with with no luck you you would develop smallpox and and run a high risk of death but with a bit of luck it would render you immune after a mild uh, illness the importance of of smallpox and remember this is a time when there was no diagnostic testing and the concept of what a virus and in fact even any infectious agent is was not even developed uh, but there are some areas where there are relatively good records and you can see that um, the, uh, the, the deaths caused by smallpox as a share of all deaths occurring in London from 1700 up to 1900. Um, how, how high, firstly, how what a large proportion of all deaths were due to smallpox. It was a major killer um, during these peak times. Over 10% of deaths occurred due to smallpox in those years. But then after the vaccination had become available, 1796, and then it was introduced, how that proportion really rapidly diminished. So a major progress. Um, and this map shows, it's from WHO, uh, when in, in each uh, place a smallpox was eradicated. That vaccine, the smallpox vaccine, is anything but safe by modern standard. It had a high rate of uh, sometimes severe and, and occasionally even fatal uh, side effects, but it was highly effective and it allowed this to, be the, to become the first ever human infectious disease to be eradicated. And eradication was certified by WHO in 1980. Now, that is the good news. Uh, the, the bad news is that in the context of this drive to eradicate smallpox, um, surveillance efforts were increased and uh, other diseases uh, that, that looked clinically similar uh, were investigated in detail. And that allowed the identification of the first case of infection with the close related but different virus uh, called erroneously monkeypox virus and that first case was in a child in DRC in 1970. The name monkeypox is a misnamer which is why the disease has now been renamed mpox uh, and it is a pure chance because in 1958 the virus was detected when it occurred in captive monkeys um, but it is clear that uh, monkeys are not the natural host of this virus so this is why monkeypox the term is deemed uh, uh, incorrect and therefore we, we uh, started using mpox instead. 
from the clinical aspect, a pap macular papular cutaneous rash uh, is similar to that caused by smallpox virus. And at the time already, there were fears that with the ecological niche in the human population uh, vacated by smallpox, which no longer exists except in two high security laboratories worldwide, that uh, mpox, the monkeypox virus, could possibly uh, emerge to fill that niche. So surveillance efforts were ongoing, but numbers reported were very small. You see the numbers during the 1970s, uh, very sprinkling of cases in West Africa. Um, which are due to what is called now the clay 2 of uh, the monkeypox virus and 38 cases in DRC caused by clay 1, a different clay of the same virus. This is the 1980s. Again, numbers are overall relatively low. During that time, there was a massive effort in the DRC to improve surveillance, yet less than 350 cases were found in that year. And so it continued in the 1990s. So numbers remained relatively low. And then a surprise came. Um, and that was really uh, linked and, and is, a, is a prime example of, of what human ignorance, stupidity, greed, or whatever else can achieve. Because suddenly in 2003, while the uh, uh, Iraq war uh, was ongoing and SARS outbreak was being contained in, in East Asia, um, monkeypox cases occurred in the United States. Now, those were due to the importation of small mammals from West Africa into the United States for the pet trade. And they were kept together with the local, the, 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 the autochthonous uh, prairie dogs. So these are uh, animals living in the North American prairie that had never previously uh, encountered this virus because it is native to the African continent, but proved to be susceptible. They became infected. They were sold off to the unsuspecting public. And then the buyers of these uh, uh, animals as pets, um, and particularly children, then developed lesions that were quickly identified as monkeypox. The problem was defined. Um, fortunately, nobody came to, to, to greater harm. And ever since, there have been more strict uh, controls on the, on the pet trade. Um, and it's just a, a prime example of how, you know, something which is really not necessary, this is, is just to make money, um, you know, how that can trigger, un, you know, uh, unforeseen uh, problems that maybe shouldn't have been that unforeseen. And, and clearly, the lack of testing and quarantine uh, were not, not shining examples of public health. And then we move to the next decade, and you see the number of cases in DRC, but also in Nigeria, are increasing uh, of, of MPOX. That is now the 2010 to 2019. Um, and you see a sprinkling of uh, cases in uh, the UK, Israel, and Singapore due to people who had been exposed in the areas thought to be endemic in the tropical rainforest regions of Africa, uh, and who had then traveled there and in some cases transmitted the virus to close contacts. Throughout this time, it was believed that this could not pose a major problem in that the sores were clearly, and that is still the present day, not, not beautifully defined, are small mammals living wild in, a, in, in, in nature, and humans become infected through interaction with these animals, for example, hunting them for the bushmeat trade. Oftentimes, it was teenage young men um, who, would, uh, who would be the primary victims because they presumably went out and uh, hunted and skinned and prepared these animals um, or sold them on. And there was limited transmission from human to human uh, following such zoonotic transmission events. And it was thought that the infectiousness of the transmissibility of this virus from human to human would not be sufficient to cause uh, uh, an outbreak and, and, and a further spread. This was wrong. And uh, it is, uh, you know, this is something which uh, an article which appeared just last week in Science Magazine. I put the a link at the bottom. Bottom um, is a fascinating account of how in Nigeria, starting in 2017, it was recognized that the characteristic had changed, that now this virus had assumed different characteristics from previously, that it was no longer confined 
to people with either direct uh, um, uh, exposure to the small mammals in the in a natural context um, and very limited uh, onward transmission in the family context or other close contacts that now this virus was um, rapidly spreading from human to human. This was unfortunately um, not totally, but largely ignored, uh, clearly on the global scale, until then, uh, uh, two and a half years ago, the scenario changed markedly. Um, there was a global outbreak um, that occurred uh, starting in, 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 in early 2022, uh, which now affected with an unprecedented number of cases. The current count stands at, at 100,000 uh, worldwide. And the most affected countries like the United States, Brazil, uh, Spain, France, Colombia, uh, Mexico, Peru, UK, Germany and Canada, they were outside these areas and clearly these cases were not linked to direct uh, uh, introduction from the uh, endemic countries, but they were acquired through direct person to person transmission, uh, oftentimes uh, the sexual route and um, oftentimes linked to uh, men having uh, sexual exposure um, to other men. So it was a totally different risk group and a totally different behavior uh, of this virus. And this is a, a, a report that shows the, the, the dark blue areas uh, of the countries. I mean, the darker blue, the, the more cases have occurred. And you see this is now suddenly uh, uh, become a global disease. Um, which can be linked back to the uh, ongoing human-to-human -human transmission occurring in uh, Nigeria since 2017, which at some stage then jumped off the African continent, spread to Europe and from there to the rest of the world. And this is the case profile of uh, over 30,000 cases. You see that the vast majority are male, uh, young adult males, the uh, majority are uh, identified as, as men who have sex with men, and the vast majority also reported sexual encounters. So it was sexual transmission um, of, of a virus and that was previously thought uh, to be a zoonotic infection acquired uh, in remote uh, areas covered by uh, Central African rainforests, so very different. What's also different, fortunately, is that um, this, on the whole, was not a catastrophic outbreak, uh, in that a uh, few cases were severe and relatively few deaths occurred. That stands in contrast to what was previously described from Africa, where the clade one, the, the uh, African, the Congo Basin uh, area, had a case fatality rate of around 10% and clade two in along the West African coast uh, had a case fatality rate of, of two to 3%. So uh, uh, lower, but still a lot higher than what was observed during the uh, global outbreak. Uh, so th th the other factor is of course that um, the uh, case fatality rate is dependent on the uh, quality of healthcare people receive. And there are some, uh, uh, reports and speculations that this may have further uh, changed the, the the picture during the global outbreak. So I'm I'm coming back now to, to to Africa. These are the areas where the clade one here in blue and the clade two virus here in green um, uh, are endemic. That means they occur in their uh, uh, small mammal hosts, many of which have not been well described and characterized. And in fact, some clades have not even been, or subclades have not yet uh, been found in their natural house. So uh, there is still a lot that we don't know. Uh, that is what we thought. And now this picture has changed. There is evidence not only uh, in, in classic epidemiology, but also uh, using uh, genetic uh, epidemiological um, uh, genomic epidemiology um, that sustained human to human transmission. That means no repeated introduction from animal reservoirs must have taken place several years before the global outbreak of what is called clade 2B. So it's a subclade of clade 2, the West African clade, before that caused the global outbreak. So, um, and that can be measured by 
by looking at how many mutations are present in the viral genome um, that are linked to its uh, replication in the human genome, in the, in the human host. If, if this virus had recently been uh, reintroduced from a zoonotic reservoir, those would not be expected to be found. So, so there is good evidence that this had been circulating for several years before it then went global. Fortunately, as mentioned before, case fatality rates during the global outbreak are much lower, which may be linked firstly to it being due to the clay 2, uh, which previously already had a lower case fatality rate, um, but also surely due to improved uh, management of cases. Um, yet, uh, the outbreak was significant enough and, and its initial spread was just breathtakingly rapid uh, for WHO to declare a public health emergency of international concern, which lasted for uh, about a year. Um, that doesn't mean the outbreak is over. Cases are still occurring um, around the world, but at a much lower number um, due to Firstly, risk groups uh, knowing about it and taking precautions. Secondly, vaccines having been made available to risk groups. And then, of course, also the, that uh, members of risk groups may have been infected and may have been uh, rendered immune. Fortunately, vaccines developed against smallpox uh, are also protective against uh, the monkeypox virus and other related orthopox viruses. Um, we no longer use the original smallpox vaccine. There is a derivative, which is, is cell culture derived, which is uh, already safer. But uh, the modern uh, variants to this are actually uh, limited uh, replicating or non-replicating uh, viruses that are very immunogenic, yet also very safe. They were not developed against uh, Mpox. They were developed in preparation of a possible bioterrorism or biowarfare attack using smallpox or related virus. They're so, to, so called a, a byproduct of these preparations. Measures were taken um, and uh, on the whole, this uh, outbreak um, came, you know, culminated and, and peaked relatively soon. And since then case numbers have come down. There are many remaining uncertainties. I don't want to, to, to go into these uh, too much. I'd rather show the, the, uh, the, 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 the global curse by, by WHO um, and come to the lessons that should, should be learned or should have been learned from this global outbreak. Um, it's yet another one of those pathogens that have been known for decades. And then suddenly and, and apparently un, unexpectedly um, develop in a, in a, in a very uh, uh, bad way for, for, for human health. And other examples are West Nile, Zika, chikungunya virus, all viruses that were detected even in the, as far back as the 1940s and 50s. And for decades, uh, uh, remained largely in obscurity, and then suddenly they they spread uh, um, across wide areas of the globe, affecting uh, thousands and tens of thousands more people than ever before. And um, then also a, a lot is learned about them in in a, in a short while of time. And and then of course one regrets that that uh, not more attention has been paid to them earlier on. So ignorance is bad, and not knowing about these uh, things sufficiently is also risky. Um, and, and as mentioned, the vaccines and antivirals that are available now against Mpox are actually byproducts of preparations against biowarfare. Um, what I found very interesting, but but also uh, um, sad, that um, of uh, when, when I when I looked uh, in 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 August twenty three, so so just over a year ago, for in in PubMed for publications uh, with the keyword monkeypox, I found uh, just close to uh, just below two thousand uh, hits at the time, and more than half of them had appeared in the uh, uh, sixteen months preceding that. Which means that you know over many decades there have been fewer publications than in a little over a year once the virus hit the global stage. Um, so it's the old sad story that as long as it is seen as something that affects almost only the poor in in far flung countries of without direct uh, relevance to the uh, resource rich countries, um, there is little investment in surveillance and and in research. So there are many lessons to be learned. We, we still don't have a good idea of the animal reservoirs and the spillover pathways. 
Um, one needs to consider that, that um, as the prairie dog incidence shows, but also SARS-CoV-2 in white-tailed deer in, in North America, uh, the phenomenon of a reverse zoonosis, that is infection of animals uh, from infected human beings, is also a possibility. And what one really would not want to see is the establishment of new natural reservoirs in different animal species in different geographical areas that may have become that may become infected uh, through human patients. So that is also something to to keep in mind. What I also found quite quite fascinating is how how quickly this uh, massive outbreak was contained because the MSM community rose to the challenge, changed their behaviors, and volunteered for for vaccination. I don't really want to go into the clinical features of Epox uh, too much, just to highlight that clinically it can be, um, it needs to be distinguished from several other rash illnesses, uh, starting of course with chickenpox, um, uh, varicella zoster virus infection, which may look similar, um, herpes simplex virus infection, uh, primary, secondary syphilis, um, and various other infectious and non-infectious diseases that may resemble uh, the rash uh, seen during MPOX. The a few photographs I showed earlier were rather typical cases, and and you know one should probably now have a very high index of suspicion that MPOX needs to be ruled out uh, in in such cases. But it does not always have to present in that fulminant form, uh, which is clinically relatively easy uh, to distinguish. And if it is, for example, a sexually transmitted infection and it affects the, the, the rashes primarily on the, in the genital tract, then a lot more differential diagnosis come to mind. And it may be very difficult to actually um, you know, detect these cases. One can only wonder how many of these cases are, uh, are properly diagnosed. On the other hand, of course, with the um, with a whole range of, of uh, differential diagnosis, one also wonders how many of the suspected cases that have not been laboratory confirmed might indeed be something else. And we really urgently need to have better access to testing in the affected areas um, in, in, in order to understand better what's actually happening. Uh, briefly, coming uh, uh, you know to my uh, my uh, adopted home country South Africa we had a few cases uh, back in 2022 that were part of the global outbreak all clay to be as should be and then earlier this year we had quite again surprisingly uh, a, a number of cases the count st stands at about 24 currently um, and, and you see them here, and they were not related to what's happening currently in Eastern DRC. They are our global outbreak strain 2B. Um, and, and if you remember what I said about the relatively low case fatality rate, well, of our 24 cases here in South Africa, three died. Um, so much higher uh, CFR and, and, and very tragic. And, and some of the cases who survived uh, also had very severe disease. And, and the, the common factor in these cases is that these were people with unknown immunodeficiency. In fact, most of them were uh, undetected and untreated advanced HIV infections. And that just shows that what may look like a relatively benign clinical presentation of an infectious disease may be quite different in a different context when you are no longer in the in the global north where you know people have a very high chance of having uh, their hiv infection diagnosed and treated well now we are moving to populations where access to treatment is difficult and diagnosis may not have been made and then suddenly this infection may take on a very different characteristic with this, if uh, the uh, next speaker is is available, I would stop um, if she has joined us uh, in in the meantime. Um, Jean, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Wolfgang. Just a quick uh, check. Uh, uh, is uh, Pro Professor Nadia Samagud on the call? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Jean. Okay, good. Um, I think we will... We will take maybe two, three questions. Thank you, uh, Wolfgang. This is really a uh, fascinating uh, uh, story. Uh, I knew you're gonna do justice. You are very uh, uh, fond of uh, history and uh, and yourself a fighter of uh, 
or those viruses. Uh, really, this was fantastic. Uh, so I, I'm going to let, uh, you know, just uh, one or two people who want to jump in and ask questions to go ahead, please. Present, just pre in, present yourself in them, in and the uh, yeah, just one, one or two questions. If not, we can get back uh, at the panel. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Professor Naida Sama Agudu, uh, who go, who's a pediatrician. She's going to introduce herself much better. And uh, really, we uh, we look forward to hear from you, Nadia. Uh, you can share your slide and just uh, kick off. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Jean. Just one second while I share my slide. Mm Just one second. Yeah. And and thank you again, Nadia. I know you're just landing uh, from one city to another city in Africa, in I think from Ghana to Nigeria. So we appreciate you taking the time. Uh, Again, it's impressive to see all the number of people connected. We are about to 126, uh, which uh, it's a testimony of the interest of the topic. And uh, we, excellent. We can see your slide, Nadia. Just uh, briefly introduce yourself and kick off. All right, great, thank you. Uh, and thank you all for making it today. Uh, my name is Nadia Samagudu. I'm a pediatrician with specialty in uh, pediatric infectious diseases. I have uh, several hats at several institutions, but um, I work with the University of Minnesota Medical School, the Institute of Human Virology Nigeria, where I am right now in my office in Abuja, and then also with the University of Cape Coast School of Medical Sciences. And so my job, and thank you to Jean and uh, Free Health for inviting me, my job is to talk about addressing the burden of MPOX, but particularly in African children. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Wolfgang Kreiser for giving us a primer on the epidemiology and really the background of how all of this came about. So I'm going to continue and particularly focus on children. So you have all heard about you know, the news, the declarations, the reports. Um, um, there's a lot of traction, right, uh, on MPOX right now. And in all of this news, we ask ourselves, you know, I ask myself, what about the African children? Uh, what about the children, but particularly what about the African children? What are we doing for them? Um, how are we focusing on them? And I thought I'd start off with um, 
a paper, a review paper that myself and uh, a Ghanaian colleague and Nigerian colleague uh, wrote on uh, pediatric mpox, but globally. And this was something we published in 2023, but we really only had about a year of 2022 behind us uh, when we wrote this review. And so the question we were asking was, you know, um, part of the questions we're asking is what is the burden of mpox in African children? If we're gonna address the burden, at least we must start by knowing the burden and then how to address it. And just for so that everybody knows, the quality and volume of data regarding mpox in children, particularly in African children, have not been very good. So I'll start off with this, uh, a couple of tables from the paper that we wrote. Uh, you can see this table is uh, mpox cases and deaths reported to WHO um, from uh, endemic African countries before 2022, before the global pandemic. And you can see several countries listed on the left here, 11 countries. They have data on number of cases, number of deaths and case fatality rate in total. But when it comes to child cases, child deaths, child case fatality rates, there was no data. And this is from WHO, there is no data. Then uh, we looked, you know, after the global um, outbreak, what do we have? We had data, but no disaggregated data for children. So we already have a problem with understanding what is going on with children, because I as a pediatrician cannot tell what is going on with children when I look at the cases in total. It's very difficult for us to understand what's going on with children because the ways that disease manifests in children are different in adults from epidemiology to clinical manifestations and to um, the outcomes. So um, I wanted also to show this table from the same paper where we are looking at uh, global and then mpox cases and deaths reported to WHO, looking at it in detail. Now, in the 2022 outbreak, the point of this slide is to say that in the 2022 outbreak, children comprised a higher proportion of mpox cases in Africa than globally. And that's really always been the case within African countries before the outbreak, before the global outbreak, uh, after the global outbreak was declared over, and even now as we are having um, a surge of cases across the African continent. And I want you to draw your eyes to these two red boxes I've put in here, just to note that this data was as of the end of the year in 2022, uh, right? The end of the first year, uh, first calendar year of the global outbreak. But you see here that when we look at proportion of all cases that are children, and by children, I mean zero to 17 years, when you look at the WHO African region, this is 38.5%, almost 40%, almost four in 10 cases in the African region where children zero to 17 years. And then globally for the same age group is less than 2%, basically 1.2%. So it gives you an idea of given how much focus was put on MPOX globally, how much of that would have been for children if we just focus on the global epidemiology and not look at African epidemiology. So after 2022, what about the children? You know, Dr. Apraiza has talked about the, um, the epidemiology of outbreaks, the CLAID-1, CLAID-2, 2A, 2B, 1A, 1B. What is going on with children after 2022? What is the epidemiology of that uh, for African children? And I want this map to send a message here that African children have to deal with MPOX, right? Uh, but they also have to deal with other infections of pandemic potential, plus vaccine preventable diseases that have highest impact in children. They have to deal with all of these things because even for diseases for which we've had vaccines for decades, there are many children in African countries who have not had any of these vaccines or have not been fully covered for these vaccines, which puts large populations of African children at risk of these vaccine preventable diseases for these for routine immunizations, as well as mpox itself, as well as other diseases of pandemic potential that do not have um, vaccines available yet. So uh, on the left here, you see the map showing the mpox virus clades detected in Africa, and you can see in West Africa. Um, um, the shading here showing clay 2A and 2B. You can see Cameroon as well. Um, um, you can see DRC, and you can see some of the other countries in East Africa that are, are, are affected as well. This is what the children have to deal with in terms of mpox across Africa. But then if you look at the um, map on the right, this is also ongoing. And these two maps are from similar dates. The one on the left is as of 1st September, 
the one on the right is as of 31st August. So more or less similar dates. And all of these things are ongoing. And I thought I would highlight some of these other disease conditions that are also issues. Um, right here in Nigeria, we are dealing with Coronibacterium diphtheriae, whooping cough. We are dealing with Lassa fever. Um, in Ghana and Togo, we are dealing with um, cholera. Um, in DRC, which is really ground zero for, for MPOX, they are also dealing with cholera. They are dealing with yellow fever. They are dealing with polio, uh, as well as MPOX, and then also measles virus. So children have to add high risk of, of, of infection and high risk of um, severe outcomes with all of these diseases. So put these two maps together in your head and think of the average child who may not have access to who may not have been covered, who may be malnourished and have other uh, vulnerabilities for these infections. It is a, a tough situation uh, to be in. So I thought I'd show this table that has selected African countries that have been reporting MPOX cases. This is not the whole list, just a few that I thought I would highlight. And this is the latest Africa CDC report as of 25th August, 2024. And the data is cumulative for January to uh, 25th August. And you can see here, Countries that are of significant concern recently, uh, for example, Burundi, which in the last five days is averaging almost 40 cases a day that are being reported. I mean, that's incredibly high. And But note the proportion of children, about 40% of the Burundi cases as of August 25, cumulatively are children. And they reported that data for children under 10 years. For Cameroon, they've had some cases, but again, Unless it's a highlight of the week, you don't get data on how many children, what proportion of children. Cote d'Ivoire, at least it was a highlight. 25% of the cases are children, and these are children less than 15 years. For DRC, 62% of the almost 18,000 cases were children. I mean, that is significantly large. The majority um, of cases here in children. What did they mean by children? For that report, it was not specified. So for me as a pediatrician, I'm asking, is it under one, under five, under 10, under 15, under 17? I don't know. And then there's data for Kenya. And then I thought I'd add Nigeria as well. For this week, um, the, the last uh, situation report, um, this is the cumulative number of cases, but the proportion wasn't reported. For the previous site report, I think the number was about 30% of the cases um, in Nigeria were, um, were children. And they reported that for under 10 years of age. So again, it does not cover the whole spectrum of what you expect for zero to 17 or zero to 19, if you are looking at children and adolescents by definition. So I thought I'd also show um, some data from WHO. This is a summary of the proportion of cases that reported different symptoms. Um, uh, these were people who were, uh, had confirmed MPOX. And you can see, at least at the top, any rash, fever, systemic rash, genital rash, and uh, any lymphadenopathy at the top five. Remembering that there's been um, um, transmission by, gen by sexual contact or sexually connected uh, uh, um, transmission of MPOX. And so genital rash, of course, it would make sense that it's, it's top there. And this is for all cases globally. But I thought I'd um, superimpose that on data that we have available for children uh, with respect to MPOX uh, symptoms uh, that they present with. And this is from an excellent systematic review that was published earlier this year in the Lancet. And so most common pediatric manifestations of MPOX um, rash is, uh, and for children from that systematic review is 100%. Um, fever is about three quarters, 73%. And then the next is any lymphadenopathy. It's about half of them. So children don't typically present with a genital rash um, um, for uh, MPOX. Um, and so I just thought I would mention that so that we have an understanding of how different children can be in their presentation versus uh, the rest of the population. Now, we have an idea of what the burden is. We have an idea of what children tend to present with. How do we prevent and treat MPOX infection in African children? And I'm going to bring some highlighted points from uh, an online article I wrote uh, recently where I was focusing on MPOX in the DRC and why children are particularly high risk. But what I'm going to say here is relevant for all children, um, even as I'm speaking uh, about um, children in uh, African countries, including the DRC. So um, 
outside of a few studies or trials that are running on MPOX, for example, in the DRC and the Central African Republic, there's really little to no, data, no vaccine available. And I think uh, uh, Professor Prizer may have mentioned that uh, before. The Africa CDC estimates that we need 10 million doses to stop the current outbreaks uh, across Africa. There have been recent donations to Africa CDC from different entities in Europe uh, and Asia, um, uh, and I think North America as well. Uh, for example, there have been 215,000 doses of the MVABN or Genius vaccine that have been um, uh, donated. More MVABN donations are underway, but note that as far as children are concerned, this vaccine is not is contraindicated for children. It's not always it's not indicated for children at this time. So only those 18 years and above can be vaccinated. However, Japan has a pledged three million doses of their LC16 vaccine, um, which is currently the only Mpox vaccine that can be used in children. And the Japan's experience with giving this vaccine is with children as young as one to seven years of age. And note that in these reports of Mpox from African countries. There have been children as young as two weeks of age who have had confirmed uh, Mpox infection. So we are in dire need of a vaccine that can be used in really young children. As far as therapeutics are concerned, we really don't have antivirals that are, are, are um, targeted for treating Mpox. Um, tecovirimat was one that we had a lot of hope in, but the recent study uh, results showed safety, but no efficacy for Mpox. You might go back to the drawing board and do other um, trials with this particular drug. There are other drugs that I will not mention that are in the pipeline, but really the one that would um, have some um, um, availability in African countries that we thought we would start moving in uh, was tecovirimat. Um, so we have African children facing Mpox uh, outbreaks across Africa with no vaccine available, at least the one that is popularly used is for 18 and above. And then uh, there's a Japan LC16 vaccine. There are some who might say we need trials or we need additional safety and efficacy data for that LC16 vaccine for children. But Japan has used it in thousands of children in their own experience uh, as young as one to seven years of age. So what do we do when there's so little to work with in African countries? How do we manage this in children? So I'd want you to think of Mpox in children, again, as from that previous slide that I showed, fever, rash, lymphadenopathy, meaning your lymph nodes are enlarged. Those are the top three signs of symptoms. Um, if there's going to be severe disease um, and death, it comes from complications of infection. One of the most important of which is super infection of the skin lesions. So the skin lesions are there, they might be um, breaking down or scratched, and then infection gets in there. And for children, children and especially young children and infants, their body is not well compartmentalized in terms of protection from infection. And that's one of the things that renders them effectively immunocompromised by age. And so um, they can, what we call, they can seed infection from the skin lesions into the bloodstream and get bloodstream infections and can develop sepsis. And sepsis is bloodstream infection that can affect organ function. You can have kidney failure, um, um, liver failure, whatnot, from you know, uncontrolled bloodstream infection. So what do we do? First, when we are managing children, we need to operate with the fact that children are essentially immunocompromised. And my children uh, that I'm most concerned about would be those under one, under two, and under five years but in general under five, but then I sort of categorize them in those blocks uh, in terms of you know, um, improvements, that's physiologic improvements in their in immune competency. What do we do with these children? We isolate them at home or in, or in the hospital if they need hospitalization. We provide antibiotics either um, prophylactically, i.e. for prevention or for prompt treatment when we see that there is super infection. We optimize nutrition. Um, children in a lot of these settings, including DRC in the areas of conflict, uh, may not have had access to food. They may already be malnourished. And, and, and a malnourished person, particularly a malnourished child who has an ongoing infection, it is a huge risk factor for developing severe disease and death. And then, of course, supportive or symptomatic treatment, um, give them medication for pain. Um, Mpox lesions in so some people can itch, and the itching causes scratching, and the scratching can then lead to having super infections. So managing the itching, and then of course, if they have fever, 
especially as you've diagnosed the source of the fever, they can have some comfort in getting anti-fever medications. So for public health in general, we're looking at community and populations. Children need, we need to keep up with routine vaccination for vaccine preventable diseases. Those vaccines are available already. We need to make sure that there's adequate coverage for it. For example, measles. Remember the map that I showed you? There's measles outbreaks going on um, in DR, uh, Congo as well as, as, as well as a couple of other African countries. You do not want mpox and measles coming together to infect children at all. Um, and so we need to manage the diseases for which we have available vaccines. Uh, for example, areas of conflict and uh, internally displaced people's camps. Of course, concurrent infections, we make sure that in, in providing vaccines for those diseases for which we have vaccines, we can reduce the incidence or the prevalence, prevalence and incidence of concurrent infection. There have been cases reported of concurrent mpox and chickenpox and mpox and measles as well. And these tended to be in immunocompromised people. And as we plan, as we respond to the mpox surges across Africa, do not exclude African children from mass mpox vaccination plans. There is a vaccine for children. MVABN or Genius is not the only vaccine available. Um, there are people um, talking about ongoing studies with that Genius vaccine to try and see its safety and efficacy uh, in children, including in African children. We may not have a lot of time to wait for those. There is one. Let's work with that one and provide this to children uh, safely and for uh, effect. So uh, that is all I have. Uh, thank you very much for the time. I want to thank my collaborators uh, and the research teams that I work with, especially in Nigeria, Verdi Nigeria, that works particularly uh, on MPOC studies. So thank you very much. And uh, over to you, Jean. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, uh, uh, Prof. Nadia. That was really uh, another uh, really uh, insightful uh, eye-opener talk. Uh, so we, we have left uh, almost a few minutes. I think, uh, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Dashrat or uh, Dr. Moffenson is still on the call. Uh, there is one just uh, uh, update we, we want to make um, uh, about uh, MVABN, uh, Nadia. Uh, so M MVABN uh, uh, is, it was used off-label uh, uh, in the UK and the US during the, the global pandemic. Uh, and uh, we currently, actually, the MPOX rec, we are planning to uh, to evaluate it in DRC uh, in children. So, uh, but uh, but I agree with you, it's never been uh, approved uh, for use, but off label uh, definitely. Uh, so this yeah, was also Jean, clar it yes. was clarified by uh, was um, mentioned by uh, Doctor Pradeep, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, if uh, you want to comment on that yes i just wanted to add the studies i've seen and i might be wrong I, the largest studies i've seen or the data I, I saw the lancet paper as well was in post-exposure prophylaxis right and uh, and for african children in these outbreaks you might want to think of both pre-exposure and post-exposure right and so um i haven't seen much data on the pre-exposure prophylaxis right for children using mvabn but yes there the, there is experience in using the vaccine in children uh, and uh, uh, and these were uh, outside of Africa, at least, but there is some data and experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other quick comment, uh, question? Uh... Uh, if not, we're gonna keep on time. This this is really terrific. This was a great kickoff. We're gonna get uh, we we're gonna have a series of uh, this Mpox uh, monthly uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to thank the Afri Health leadership uh, in uh, Kumasi, Ghana. Uh, also to thank our founder, NIH Fogarty. I saw uh, the, the new director on the call. Uh, uh, thanks uh, uh, for joining. And uh, all, of, all of you, uh, again, uh, uh, we're going to have an exciting row of uh, really experts, uh, including uh, from DRC. Uh, at some point, we're going to get also Professor Jean-Jacques Muyembe. Uh, who uh, will be on the on this floor? Thank you so much, and uh, we will be in touch. Thank you. Thanks.